Will you join me in a word of prayer? O oh Lord, open thou our hearts to hear, and through thy word to us draw near. Let us thy word, air pure, retain. Let us thy children and heirs remain. Amen. In our gospel lesson for today, which comes to us from the 13th chapter of Matthew's gospel, Jesus puts before us a parable. In it, he says, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. You might be thinking, that happened in my yard. <laughs> I'd say, yeah, mine too. Wouldn't it be great if in our yards we had servants who could deal with that? Jesus goes on to talk about those servants in verse 27. Uh, the servants of the master of house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seeds in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servants said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? To this point in the parable, Jesus' parable is very understandable. It's simple. It makes sense. And this parable is what we'll be focusing on for this message. But then Jesus says that the master who sowed the seed, in verse 29, answered his servants and said, no. He said, no. Lest in gathering up the weeds, you root up the wheat along with them. Let them grow together until the harvest. Our photography club here at Holy Cross has been sharing projects by email to keep people connected digitally even during this COVID-19 time. And so the organizers of that group, John Rancor and Mike Donahue, sent out this challenge to the participants recently. The challenge was take a picture of the flower of a weed in such a way as you would not mind having them growing in your backyard and post the pictures to an email and send it to the rest of the club. Hopefully the challenge will give you a moment of peace, taking your mind off all of the negative news that is floating around and showing you the beauty of even a weed in God's creation. I tell you, I wish I had the technological capability in myself to be able to show you some of the pictures that your fellow worshipers took. There were some remarkable pictures. Now, I'm not a participant in that photography group myself, but many of them copied me in on their e-projects. So I got to see these pictures, vibrant photos, beautiful, eye-catching flowers. I mean weeds. I mean flowers. I mean weeds. <laughs> Is this what the sower has in mind in the parable that Jesus told in Matthew chapter 13, just to let his fields between now and the harvest become a natural native landscape? Long ago, back in my college years, I worked for a time for the park service of the city of Fenton, Missouri. Now, the city of Fenton was committed to showing off its natural beauty. And so there were several places in each of our parks that were designated as natural areas. You know, places where the native grasses and flowers were encouraged to flourish. I tell you, I didn't know at the time that having a native landscape actually takes work. The WSU Extension Master Gardeners here in Spokane who've given a lot of help to our community garden out back for the refugees in recent years. Well, they say this too. They say having a natural landscape doesn't just happen by letting things go. It takes design, planting, and maintenance. There was a time when every flower was a good flower. There was a time when every plant grew in its place. There was a garden that had no weeds. That time was in the beginning. And that garden had a name. 
It was called Eden. In it, everything was in its place. And when that first changed, it was not because a plant was found out of place. When that first changed, it was because a human desire was out of place. Humanity began to want something that God, the Creator, had not given to them, and so they took it for themselves. And weeds in our gardens, in our yards, in our natural landscapes, that was the consequence. Cursed is the ground because of you, says our God. And that's what he told the people who were in that garden. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 17, In pain shall you eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat from the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat your bread. Genesis 3, verses 17 through 19. Our epistle reading that was appointed for this particular Sunday of the church year that Heather read for us a few minutes ago from Romans chapter 8 echoed this in verse 20 when it said the whole creation was subject to futility, not of its own will, but because of him who subjected it. And, and the point is this, that the weeds that are growing in your yard and in my garden and the plants that are out of place in our natural landscapes, these are a reflection of our sin. They are caused by it. And, and as such, they reveal something to us about the essence of our sin. The Lord himself goes on to use weeds as that kind of a word picture and image for sin in other places in the Old Testament, such as in Hosea chapter 1. There in Hosea chapter 1, he refers in the first verse to his, I'm sorry, Hosea chapter 10. There in Hosea 10, verse 1, he refers to his people as a planting. He said, Israel is a spreading vine that brought forth fruit. That's chapter 10, verse 1, but within a few verses by verse 3, he's talking about other things that are growing up among his people. He says they make promises and they enter into agreements. They take false oaths and therefore lawsuits spring up like poisonous weeds in a plowed field. Hosea 10 verse 3. Hosea 10 verse 3. That was written in the 8th century B.C. And yet you could say the same thing today about our litigation and lawsuit happy society. When we, like the Lord, begin to compare sin to weeds, three realities become apparent about our sin. The first is that sin shows up even in places that have been cultivated by God, like the Garden of Eden, like your life and mine, which means, dear Christian friends, that we will have to deal with sin in our lives. This isn't just something that shows up in the lives of other people in the world who don't know our God. The second is this. Just when we think we've gotten a handle on it, new sins begin to crop up. <laughs> like weeds in the garden. As soon as you've gotten them weeded out, new ones will begin to come. Which means that the Christian life takes vigilance. This is not a call to complacency. And third, third, just because a want or a desire shows up in our life seemingly naturally, that does not mean that it is good. See, like weeds in a garden, sin shows up all on its own as if it is natural and belongs there. And, and that's why we say that we people have a sinful nature. Which is to say, we can't just go around saying, well, I feel this way, and therefore God made me this way, and therefore it must be good. You see, the photography club at Holy Cross even reminded their participants of this when they extended to them this challenge of taking a photo of a weed and the flower of a weed. They told them, weeds are simply plants that are not wanted in a growing area which means we can't determine what is a good flower and what is sin just by looking at it ourselves. 
we actually have to ask the one who sowed it. We have to ask the creator who planted it and who expects it to bear his fruit. Because there are many of things, actions, lifestyles, that this world looks at and calls natural and even says are beautiful, that our God says he as creator never planted and does not want in this growing area of his creation. And so the creator sorts that out for us in his word. For example, it may seem very natural for us to want to get back at those who hurt us. That has a flower, a flower that's commonly called tit for tat, and people tend to like that flower. <laughs> but the sower says, it is mine to avenge. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. That's in Romans chapter 12, verse 9. It is natural for us as people to want to give up on marriage or just to live together without marriage. But the sower says that in marriage he binds a man and a woman together so that the two shall become one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Matthew 19, verse 6. It may seem natural for us to want to spend all the hard-earned cash that we have scrimped and saved in order to make a life a little bit better for ourselves and for our family. But the sower says, Matthew chapter 10, verse 8, freely you have received, freely give. Scriptures go on to flesh that out. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6, the point is this. He who sows sparingly will reap sparingly, but he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Dear Christian friends, our God, our Creator, our Sower has sowed bountifully in our lives. Instead of avenging our sins, why He has sown bountifully His grace and His forgiveness. As He says in Isaiah 43, 25, I, even I am He who blots out your transgressions for my own name's sake and remembers your sins no more. You see, instead of discarding us like an unfaithful spouse, He has shown us an everlasting love and has come to redeem us like a bridegroom claiming His bride, which is why the Scripture says, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, Ephesians 5, 25. Why is it that we shouldn't avenge those who hurt us and instead feed them? It's because our God, even while we were his enemies, fed us with the very bread of his life. John 6, 51, Jesus said, The bread I give for the life of the world is my flesh. And there he was talking about giving his very life on the cross as bread for us, eternal bread, for the sake of every sin that showed up in our lives like a weed in a garden somewhere. Every misplaced deed or action, and he died for it. What was the curse of that sin back in Genesis that we looked at? In Genesis chapter 3, verse 19, by the sweat of your brow shall you eat your bread? <laughs> Jesus, the bread giver, also bore that curse in a garden himself as he was preparing himself for prayer, by prayer, for that experience on the cross. Luke chapter 22, verse 44 says, his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. Oh, let he who has ears to hear, hear this. Our Creator... Our sower, our redeemer, has been exceedingly gracious with you and me. And that's really the turning point, the central feature of this parable here in Matthew chapter 13. I say central feature because each of Jesus' parables tend to have a central feature, a turning point in the parable, which usually turns on that which is the most unexpected. That becomes the golden thread through the parable that leads you through to the gospel. And what is it that's so unexpected in this parable? What is so different from what we would anticipate? Why, it's the response of the master who sowed the seed. 
when the servants come to him and say, shall we gather it up? And he said to them, no. Let them grow together until the harvest. See, because what is it we would anticipate if there were weeds growing in among the wheat field? What would you expect the sower to say? Well, root them up, and the sooner the better. That's what you'd expect. I mean, even the WSU master gardeners here in the Spokane Extension say this, that weeds like quack grass tend to be so hard to eradicate because any little bits of roots that are still left in the soil can sprout new plants. And if you let them go too long before you root them out, well, then you have the problem of seeding. As soon as they go to seed, all those seeds can lay dormant in the ground for up to four years and sprout at any time. And besides the roots and the seeding issue, well, you also have the crowding issue, that these plants like quackgrass are very competitive and these weeds will crowd out any of the desirable plants that you have planted. So root them up, and the sooner the better. Even the people in the first century understood that, which is why the disciples are so confused by Jesus' parable when he says, no, let them grow together until the harvest. And so a little bit later in the chapter, verse 36, in your gospel lesson skips from verse 30 to 36, Jesus left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples followed him and came to him saying, explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. That's Jesus. The field is the world. The good seed are the sons of the kingdom. That's you and me. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, the enemy who sowed them as the devil. The harvest is the end of the age and the reapers are the angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned in the fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all the causes of sin and all the lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears, let him hear. You notice in this parable that Jesus is not comparing the weeds to individual sins in our life. Instead of in this parable, Jesus is comparing the weeds to those people in whom sin grows and through whom sin spreads. And our God, thanks be to God, is so exceedingly gracious with us, he is not removing those people from his creation yet. Thanks be to God for his graciousness because if he were to weed those people out of his creation, well, at times, at the worst of times, those people include us, don't they? In our worst moments, we are people in whom Sid is spreading not only growing in our life, but even spreading to others. And if, if he were to come and to weed out of his garden every one of those causes of sins, we might be rooted out right along with us. But God is exceedingly gracious with you and with me. And instead, he is still sowing his forgiveness into your life and mine. And he is exceedingly patient in his grace, also with the world around us. And because of his grace... And his patience. We are still here and able to affect this world with his fruit. Oh, yes, one day he will come and sort it all out. Until then, meanwhile, what's his calling in our life? In living in a place where sin is still spreading like weeds, what's his calling? Is to root ourselves deeply and draw our health from the fertile soil of God's word and from the watering of his spirit. A couple weeks ago, Vicar Sean reminded us of Psalm chapter 1, which in verse 3 says that he who delights in the law of the Lord is like a tree that's planted by a stream of water, who yields its fruit in its season, whose leaf does not wither, and everything he does prospers. 
That is what our God calls you and I to be. As we continue life in this world where sin is spreading and growing like weeds, God calls us not to react to those people outside of the community of Christ by trying to root them out of this world, but instead He calls us to be so deeply rooted in His world and so healthy in our growth for Him that we squeeze them out by competition. So let me photo share with you. All right, I said earlier, I'm not technologically advanced to do that, to send this to whatever device you're using. So let me just do it by word picture. I'm better at that. I'll give you an image, a glimpse of what that flower looks like. So back in the spring, you heard me talk about a new ministry outpost we were working on planting in North Idaho in Osborne called the Bethany Center. It would be a place where lots of work goes on in the Silver Valley community for the sake of Christ and people are trained and interns work in that way. It was all part of our Ignite 90 campaign. Much of that has been set on hiatus this spring and summer because of COVID-19. And yet Clint Kunze of Luther Haven Ministries, who runs Idaho Servant Adventures, has not forgotten about that vision. And even though Idaho Servant Adventures has not been able to bring in all of their volunteer teams from all over the country, youth groups have not been able to travel here. Instead, he's been active recruiting local youth to keep them involved in the community. And I called over and I was talking to Jeff Arthurs at Bethany Lutheran Church in Osborne just this week, and he told me that on Tuesday, Clint had a team of teenagers that were weeding the Rose Garden of a lady in Osborne who the people at Bethany Osborne had told him about, who had let her garden and her yard get away from her this year because she had too many health issues. So there they were, this volunteer team on Tuesday, weeding her rose garden. And some might say they were just weeding, but we know more what they were doing. They were sowing, and they were bearing fruit. <laughs> they were sowing the love of Christ in that community, and they were bearing fruit for Jesus. Brothers and sisters of Holy Cross, that's who we say we are here in Spokane too. We in our mission statement say we are belonging, believing, and bearing fruit for Jesus. And as such, it means that we are out in this community in ways that flowers for God's goodness, in ways that shows His good in this world. And when the world sees that flower, they get a glimpse of a truly native landscape, one that hearkens back to Eden. Hopes in Jesus, they might look forward with us to that renewal of all things in which we will once again shine like the sun in all the Lord's righteousness. Let's not let COVID-19 put that on hiatus. <laughs> Let's continue to bear fruit for him. Jesus said, he who has ears, let him hear. And to that we say,